Paper Mario. Paper Mario, Paper Mario. A once beloved RPG subseries of the Mario franchise, now a divisive, inconsistent action adventure esque brand that's only served to lay out pins and needles for anyone discussing and or playing the modern entries. 64 and Thousand Year Door, how many times have I and many others mentioned how great of Mario RPGs they were? Eventually leading to Super Paper Mario, altering the series for the first time, and while met with general praise and acclaim, it's still met with criticism against its gameplay. Fans will meet each other in sometimes rash opposition and passive aggression, but general love for Super overall, especially for the first two. Unfortunately, Sticker Star would primarily change the series for the worst and would continue its design cues and ideals in Color Splash. Now, Origami King is the most recent installment in the series, and while it is a genuine improvement from Sticker Star and Color Splash that's met with some praise and acceptance, it's still a far cry from the kind of Paper Mario the general fans want out of the series along with, in my opinion, still inhibiting some design flaws that hurt the game in the long run. Especially since Sticker Star, the series hasn't been met with the most accepting feedback or perspectives, often met with how people hate the combat, the standardization of the series, the lack of originality in characters' worlds, story, the charm the series has missed for a good while that was also lacking in Color Splash. On the flip side, you'd also be met with people who did like the modern entries, who choose to either blindly and or passive-aggressively dismiss those critiques aforementioned and vilify fans of the OG games. Nostalgia-blinded, overrated, they hate it because they hate change upon other similar generalizations and responses made to anyone who prefer the classics, despite that is the majority. If the title and or introduction to this video seems familiar, you might recognize a video I've already made, Why Paper Mario Changed. A fan and I took it upon ourselves, largely an original part to him, again thank you very much, in researching the various development cycles of Paper Mario games after the Thousand Year Door, and deducing, well, why Paper Mario changed. It gives insight on Super's development philosophies, same for Sticker Star and Color Splash, and clears a misconception or two of who it was that really affected Paper Mario, i.e. not Miyamoto. I hope you can forgive the self-promotion as I recommend watching that video if you haven't. Still heavily relevant and supportive in providing insiders on Paper Mario over the years, especially if you're not totally aware of why fans are divisive when it comes to Paper Mario, or what the hubbub is about with this flat yet unique 2D take on Mario. Consider this video a type of sequel to that. Never did I expect to make a sequel to that video, I never planned on giving that video a follow-up, it's been almost 3 years since I made it, nor did I even expect this video to be as long as it is. Apologies for the absurd length, I usually don't make videos over an hour long. But recent interviews and information over the past 2 months surrounding Paper Mario that have come out with Origami King managed to warrant a sequel to that video, especially with how utterly frustrating they are to read. So. Here we are, on Paper Mario's 20th anniversary, discussing the development cycles of the series once again, still met in large confusion and outrage, though it being its 20th anniversary or a few days late is largely a coincidence. But after Origami King, I believe there's an argument that Paper Mario is stuck in a stalemate, that it refuses to change. There are six games in the franchise, and the recent installment still does carry the core ideas and philosophies the last two games set. That's half the franchise now for almost a decade, and especially after recent interviews from developers, it does not look like they want to change that course anytime soon. I did end up playing Origami King. I made a whole review of the game, and I emphasized how it not only is the best of the modern games, but it has genuine highlights and good ideas at play that could have been fleshed out more. I don't hate the game, not even remotely as much as I did Sticker Star and Color Splash, and I never make it a point to disrespect those who liked any of the last three games. Like this video, people are allowed to express opinions, it's their right, a freedom of speech and expression. I have plenty of subs who adore the heck out of Sticker Star and Color Splash, so no. I'm not, nor have I ever been one of those to lynch modern Paper Mario fans for liking a game I don't. But in my view, it still suffers from design flaws and missing elements that are so minor yet easily deducible and changeable that it would help the structure and overall experience significantly. So no, I'm not making this video as a complete, spiteful, hate-driven 180 against the game. I've expressed I think it is a decent game, and that hasn't changed, but it'd be disingenuous and disrespectful to assume I'm only making a blind circle jerk for the OG games and defecation all over the new ones when that's not true at all. Even with its strengths, it still follows the same philosophy and idealism Sticker Star set that Color Splash encouraged, introducing some new ideas, but is still held back by some of the same flaws in different ways. And even with those new ideas, it still limits itself to ridiculous degrees that warrant backlash against them. So why? Why is Paper Mario continuing to disregard its consumers and follow the same route it was harshly criticized for numerously, near unanimously, in the past? 
Why and how did it stretch so far into the fanbase that Paper Mario discourse hasn't changed? Is there any sound or logic behind it? What do the developers think? Why is Paper Mario the way it is, and why is it so fragile now? Let's discuss. Before we begin, I still do recommend checking out why Paper Mario changed even when it's 3 years old, especially to those who aren't privy to why Paper Mario discourse is tricky and rough around the edges. But for those who may have forgotten, those who may not have the time to watch that video instead of this for some weird reason, and for those new to the entire fiasco who may want some insight and information behind the series and its reception, I'm going to make this portion a brief refresher before we dive in just to make things more accessible and easier to understand for the general viewer. There will also be timestamps for this video to make navigation easier. Paper Mario and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door two turn-based Mario RPGs that introduce a plethora of new ideas and unique stories with various interesting new worlds, new characters, colorful charm, and distinct storytelling and atmospheres you never get in almost any other Mario game even today. Both games had traditional turn-based combat with RPG elements that served ridiculous amounts of variety and depth that offered these games loads of replayability and quality gameplay on top of expanding the Mario lore and universe with these characters and tales these games told. Outside a small handful of genuine flaws these games possessed, largely in backtracking and or pacing, they're still widely beloved classics and often be hailed as some of the best Mario games in the entire franchise, not just the peak of what Paper Mario was. Then came Super Paper Mario, which still introduced new characters and an epic story of the main core Mario cast thrusted into a catastrophe that hangs the multiverse in the balance over a tale of two lovers, new characters, original concepts and locations, but the gameplay would take a drastic shift being a hybrid of some RPG elements with largely 2D platforming akin to the Super Mario Bros. games. Far simpler and more basic as far as battling and level design goes, which is where most of that game's faults lie. However, what these three games share in common is that they're radically different Mario games than you'd expect. You have a lot of customization in the gameplay and combat with items, badges, the partners that tag along and were woven into the core gameplay, the audience, etc. You'd have Mario going on quests slaying dragons, giant robots, going to twilight dense towns, outer space, uncovering a train mystery, heaven and hell, plenty of stories and tales that aren't your usual riffraff of saving Peach from Bowser. And even then, Bowser's often treated as an egotistical goof that is sometimes at his most consistent, threatening and imposing, while most often at his most charming, goofy and lovable. These games served in breaking away from the usual Mario adventure we've all come to expect from his mainline games, and deliver stories that offer different plots and more ways to expand the Mario universe. The first game was called Mario's Story in Japan, and the paper-like aesthetics served to simulate that of a pop-up book, because these games served in telling stories within the Marioverse. Upon the release of Paper Mario Sticker Star, the RPG elements would be practically completely stripped alongside the original, ambitious stories and characters in lieu of standardizing Paper Mario in much of the same vein many Mario games saw from the 2D entries in the early to mid-2010s. The same generic locations the new Super Mario Bros. series is plagued with, grasslands, desert, jungle, etc., no new characters, the same exact enemies and such, with far less charm and an identity with that. The gameplay in a battle system that served no purpose in existing due to a non-existent incentive, finite resources of attacks, and a major lack in depth and engagement. Despite the game looked to replicate that of 64 during development builds and screenshots, it turned out to be the least beloved Paper Mario. The gameplay suffered with its flawed design, and the plot boiled down to that of a majority of every other Mario game with little in between. Same exact case with Paper Mario Color Splash, basically. The writing took a heavier comedic approach, focusing more on the paper aesthetic, characters being ridiculously and commonly self-aware that it's Paper Mario, and many regard the writing as one of its strengths, which is largely true, but between both it and Sticker Star, the series essentially stopped focusing on the storytelling and RPG aspect of Paper Mario in favor of the paper visuals themselves. No XP, no partners, a finite source of attacks, linear and generic structure, it repeated a lot of the same exact design flaws, gameplay elements, and vision its predecessor had. It had largely the same locales, with a decent number of exceptions, the same plot effectively, etc. The series that's whole appeal was departing from the norm of Mario, then became the norm of Mario. Fast forward to now, the Origami King, and there are some genuine improvements. Better overall writing and character, better structure and theming, but it still follows that same limited standardized approach the last two games set. There's almost no new characters, not a lot of distinct design on the older ones, the locations outside a handful serve the same basic purpose as the 2D games, the story underutilizes its main villain and characters, and while the characters that are there are ultimately well written, 
and the decently different battle system offers plenty of potential, it still follows the same limits with suffering from almost the same problems of the last two games. What these three games have in common is not just the same philosophy set by the developers, but they share both replicating the norm most Mario games go through, as well as a theme of enforcing and emphasizing the paper aesthetic as a direct influence on everything. The writing, the visual and narrative humor, the plot, the gameplay, the stakes, it all surrounds the paper within Paper Mario. Stickers and Sticker Star being a core gameplay element and plot point, color splash with the paint, and restoring color to the world, characters creasing and folding, a majority of jokes and writing amounting to the same punchline, the stories themselves focused on stickers, paint, and origami, attacks and gameplay elements involving such, as well including art supplies, three games in a row. What was originally meant as an aesthetic is now a core influence on everything surrounding the games, and to some it looks great and makes sense, but to others this takes away from what Paper Mario was and can make these worlds and characters feel artificial, less immersive, and fake ultimately distracting players and sucking them out of the experience. You can also tell the vision between these halves of the franchise are radically separate. The chief director of the first two Paper Marios and co-director of Super Paper Mario is Ryota Kawade, the original big dog of the series. He envisioned making Paper Mario essentially a Mario story, and focusing on the characters, the story, the world building and such in a natural, more grounded sense, but left the series after Super. Other Super Paper Mario co-director and producer of every Paper Mario since Sticker Star, Kensuke Tanabe, producer of the Mario Strikers games, the Metroid Prime series, the Chibi Robo games, Luigi's Mansion 3, and many more, envisions the series in a different light. He basically views Paper Mario as having the appeal largely come from the paper, and he claims they're basically limited, if not completely restricted, on returning to the original format. Despite being the producer as well, his involvement and statements in various interviews gives an even larger impression of his overall position and influence on Paper Mario. And ever since these changes, there's kind of been a civil war among Paper Mario fans. I'm not making it a point to say it's wrong to like the new games. People can like whatever they want, it's an opinion, people have the right to share those once again. I have plenty of loyal subs who like Sticker Star and Color Splash, so that's not a problem either. But the problem is, since Sticker Star, people don't get there's reason against the modern direction, nor do they want to listen. Now more than ever, for as much as people will claim there are OG stands that will dismiss the new games and chastise new fans in a toxic manner, whom do exist? There's just as many if not more people blindly vilifying anyone for even preferring the older style or choosing to not support the newer games, no matter what reasoning, no matter how much in the right they are. A looming toxicity in Paper Mario discourse on both sides, to where I'm not just making this video discussing the interviews and giving my two cents, but emphasizing the needless complications Paper Mario and its fans have gone through now this past decade. There's more than just the direction of Paper Mario that refuses to change. This is essentially a basic summary of what you need to know if you're not into Paper Mario or its fandom by that much. The games, the reception, the developers, and their basic philosophies, etc. Hopefully this provides some of a refresher to veterans and makes things easier to understand and swallow for your average new viewer as well as the majority watching altogether. So, I'm going to resurface two interviews I mentioned in that previous video. I'm not going to go over that much since most of this I covered in that video, but it re-cements the vision of the franchise since Sticker Star. Every single interview will be linked in the description below as well. One is an Awada Asks interview of Sticker Star, involving Tanabe, Taro Kudo, one who's in charge of the script and direction of the game, who's gone on to continue making the script for later entries, who's also the director of Color Splash, Kenji Nakajima, who's in charge of project development at Intelligent Systems for the Paper Mario series, and now Hiko Aoyama, who art directed the first game but has gone on to direct Sticker Star and Color Splash. I mentioned Taro Kudo and now Hiko Aoyama before, and some of these guys, including Tanabe, often got more press during Sticker Star, yet since then a majority of it has surrounded primarily Tanabe. During this interview, there's several points that 90% of the staff were working on planning and designing for Sticker Star were brand new. Not a lot of developers who worked on Paper Mario's prior stuck with the franchise and development chugged because an early beta of the game, played by Shigeru Miyamoto around E3 2010, was stated to be very similar to TTYD, to which he suggested a big change in the atmosphere, which eventually led to the big theme surrounding stickers, and reworking the game's mechanics in order to change things more. Fast forward to Spring 2011, 
another prototype was made and Miyamoto regarded it as boring, despite Tanabe thinking otherwise. He questioned a story being necessary and to complete it with as many characters within the Super Mario world as possible. Now obviously this raises a red flag, but all Miyamoto did was provide suggestions and later on we see him inhibit less and less direct involvement in Paper Mario onward, which I'll explain later. Tanabe mentions how difficult it'd be to surmount how important keeping or canning the story may be, so he opted in creating a survey on Club Nintendo to where not even 1% said they favored the story of Super Paper Mario. Kudo mentions how they didn't need many RPG elements, they could get by with having objective-based levels and boss fights. Kudo also relished in the challenge of being limited on using new characters and only old ones, and Tanabe expressed how this tied into them changing the battle system, getting rid of partners, focusing on the stickers, and how Tanabe has thought for a long while prior to Sticker Star of getting rid of the RPG system. They made sure stickers would be easy to come by anywhere in the game so people wouldn't run out. Tanabe also encouraged going all out with the paper ideas, all that stuff. The purpose of reiterating all of this is to cement where their mindset was since Sticker Star, and put in perspective their mindset is today, as you'll see this largely won't change over the near decade. There's another Sticker Star interview I found where Tanabe, Kudo, and Aoyama discuss the development with Nintendo Life, but it largely reiterates most of what I already said in the Iwata Axe interview. I'll link it, but it's largely most of what I just said. The second interview I'm revisiting is one surrounding Color Splash, where Game Informer interviewed Tanabe on Paper Mario after Color Splash. Not a whole lot to re-emphasize, Tanabe largely mentions how one of the ideas behind the paint came from one of the staff's kids coloring, how they still continued ditching the RPG elements, and explained how the hammer scraps acted as meaningful XP, despite it being ultimately a faux XP system that ended up not affecting the gameplay by much, how they didn't want to remove the combat entirely so they opted to just make it a hurdle for Mario, how he's still following that vision of respecting Miyamoto's comments from Sticker Star, again, not much different from the first time I covered this one. So right now, we can clearly see Tanabe does respect Miyamoto a ton, and as mentioned in a Luigi's Mansion 3 video where him and one of the other developers did a wheel spin game, one of the topics was who one considers the most fearsome foe, and Tanabe mentions how it's Miyamoto, and he's never been able to surpass him. So even up to recently, we know Tanabe has loads of respect for Miyamoto, and it seems he's trying to replicate or follow some vision Miyamoto has, or a similar vision. There's nothing wrong with admiring and respecting one of your seniors, but at the same time, not only are Miyamoto's comments on the entire Mario brand aren't the same as they were back in 2011, and I already disclosed how Miyamoto wasn't or at least shouldn't be the sole proprietary cause of the lack of character, story, and RPG gameplay, you don't need to limit yourself so heavily based on that. Miyamoto hardly had much involvement in Sticker Star, he had even less in the Paper Marios afterwards. Tanabe, Aoyama, Kudo, like these guys in Intelligence Systems are the ones making the games. Tanabe and the others do have the power to say no. Yoshiaki Koizumi, another profound developer in both Mario and Zelda games, big producer behind the Switch itself, and Eiji Aonuma, project manager behind the Zelda series, have done so before. They've had ideals and visions clashed directly at Miyamoto, Super Mario Galaxy, the whole Rosalina backstory thing, Zelda's Link's Awakening, how it's more than just a standard remake of A Link to the Past, Majora's Mask, Skyward Sword, I've mentioned some of this in that other video. Not only that, but it clearly sounded like they had little understanding of what the appeal was for Paper Mario, both Miyamoto at the time, and these guys in intelligence systems, especially up to now. Paper Mario was beloved for its story, for its characters, for its RPG gameplay. The unique and really distinct designs on old characters, the big slew of new characters, these creative, expansive, and unique worlds, these insane, high-stakes, climactic stories with heartfelt, natural moments. The first Paper Mario game was called Mario Story in Japan for crying out loud. Ever since Sticker Star, most people specified these were what most envisioned Paper Mario. Even Ryota Kawade had this vision looking at the interviews from the other video. It didn't help that the gameplay change not only went at odds with what the series' identity was at that point, but the combat itself was still super flawed and redundant to the overall experience. Limiting the character variety to just Toads didn't help either, along with the map level select. That pool of club Nintendo votes was such a far cry from how most people feel about Paper Mario, especially Super. You look anywhere on the internet, the most popular, most beloved aspect about Super Paper Mario is its story. People adored 64, Thousand Year Door, and Super because of the story. The original unique characters, all that jazz. And even then, you can still be a lot more creative with the limited characters you have. Why not make Koopas and Penguins play a non-enemy role like in past games? There used to be variety in both NPCs by species and design, and enemies even when you take out all the new and original ones. It's like if you took mainline Zelda and changed it from an action-adventure game with puzzle elements 
into a rhythm game or if mainline Pokemon became a racing game. They could be good games or average games with good elements, but at that point it stops feeling like Pokemon or Zelda. The vision of those games at that point would not match the original vision and intent, and it would alienate those who've come to know the series and wane and falter in appeal, consistency, and popularity, especially if those elements that changed and were different are flawed and hampered the experience. That's exactly why people dislike modern Paper Mario so much as is these past 8 years, because it went against the series' original intent and identity that made Paper Mario as popular and generally loved as it was. Before we reach the Origami King interviews, there is one more interview by US Gamer who talked with the assistant producer of Color Splash and Origami King who was interviewed after the former, Risa Tabata, and she made the argument Paper Mario was also more about the puzzle elements, not just the RPG elements, so they've been focusing more on the puzzle aspects of these games, which you can see a lot more in Sticker Star, but especially Color Splash and the Origami King. Puzzles are an element of Paper Mario that is true, they tie into the dungeons of all these games, but to focus more on that than the actual core gameplay, if not the RPG aspect of it all, I feel wasn't wise. Like, this comment wouldn't be that big of an issue to me if they didn't omit most of the RPG elements in favor of this. Not to mention there are still some comparisons made to Mario and Luigi here, but I won't get on that until much later, nor will I harp on Tabata that much. She largely had little to do with Paper Mario Shift, and came in after Sticker Star, she did adopt the recent vision more easily, as I'll show in a bit, and isn't the source of how the series is now. Now at this point, I've already exhausted my two cents on the series before Origami King. Two games in a row and the series was largely met with harsh criticism and backlash with the decisions and design philosophies surrounding Sticker Star and Color Splash, and that was for five to six years then. There was a large disconnect between the consumers and or fans of the franchise with the current development staff and the Paper Mario fans tried super hard in voicing their thoughts in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, Kensuke Tanabe, Naohiko Aoyama, Taro Kudo, somebody at Nintendo or Intelligence Systems would get a clue and adhere to that feedback and criticism. I was confident there'd even be a decent chance of Paper Mario revisiting its traditional format, given how much time there was between both Sticker Star and Color Splash, where there was a swath of backlash against Color Splash before release, and between Color Splash and what would eventually be Origami King, especially tied to how various other franchises, primarily the other Mario series, cater to their audiences and fans and adhere to various criticisms and feedback across them. And when the first trailer for Origami King dropped, I obviously wasn't the most looking forward to it or the most optimistic, but at that point I already accepted Paper Mario had zero intention of returning to its original roots. It was visibly clear from that first trailer they just wanted to stick with this direction, despite thousands upon millions outright specified, we don't want Sticker Star's direction. We liked Paper Mario when it focused more on having big epic natural plots with original characters under an RPG system that not only worked, but was well designed and especially fun. But Origami King still following the same design philosophies, and even, in my opinion, most of the same problems as the last two games. For as much as it can offer, it's still left either an apathetic or dry taste in people's mouths upon the first trailer, despite what it teased, and the interviews only served to sour those feelings even more. One interview released prior to the game releasing, and Risa Tabata was called upon again by Video Games Chronicle and emphasized how their motivation for change is largely driven by Miyamoto's comment to Tanabe, which Tanabe passed on to the rest of the staff. I quote the philosophy of game creation that producer Mr. Tanabe learned from Mr. Miyamoto, and that in turn he's imparted to me, is to challenge yourself to create new gameplay. Games are entertainment, so I want people who play our games to say, wow. My understanding is that if we want to give players these positive surprises, we can't do exactly the same thing that's been done before. To make matters more disappointing, Kensuke Tanabe was also involved in this and he emphasizes how they focus on the puzzle elements of this game, like how Tabata emphasized in Color Splash, and they can't ignore their casual crowd which resulted in that, and how he believes it's, and I quote, difficult to satisfy certain fans with the adventure game direction if they think of Paper Mario games as simply being RPGs. Yeah, a complete opposite sentiment with the actual fans, and wait until the end of this for my spiel. He's gone on to clarify how they're focusing on the action-adventure element of it more, and to add more insult to injury, he mentioned how Super Paper Mario's elaborate story led the game away from the Mario universe, so he tried to refrain from using complicated stories since Sticker Star as a result. It's also apparently, apparently, no longer possible to modify pre-existing characters or create characters that touch on the Mario universe since Sticker Star, and they have to create characters that either exist in the Mario world, or don't clash with the Mario universe at all. <sighs> okay, where do I begin? Um, 
There's a lot here that's just nonsensical, ignorant, and so unbelievably out of touch and tone deaf with what the consumers and fans want and have wanted out of this series for almost a decade now, alongside the entire vision and appeal of Paper Mario. Holy hell. Um, I guess I'll start with the philosophy behind the game design and the constant need to change it up. This is primarily the only instance where the series sees some change on average every two games now. It's usually around the core gameplay and combat. The devs feel this constant need to change things up for a new experience, so they opt for some major battle system overhaul. Personally, I feel like they may have good intentions in doing this, but those intentions are misplaced far more than they were originally. These constant gameplay changes have not done this franchise any favor since Super. Forget Sticker Star, Super's main criticism is the gameplay. People feel the level design and mechanics are at best average and at worst bad in some cases. Combat amounted to exactly how the 2D Mario games function, but even that had RPG elements that gave the combat structure and significance. They're just existing for the sake of it being a change, and people do love Super for the most part. The gameplay is the main criticism of that game. Ever since Sticker Star, these ideals and changes have not served in delivering a well-balanced, structured, or even just fun experience for most. Color Splash kept the same exact battle system of Sticker Star, and even with the potential of Origami Kings battling, it still offers little incentive to go out and do these when you're rewarded for doing literally everything else the game has, which is more fun in my opinion. And when there's little engagement in the combat itself outside the puzzle elements, that loses its novelty after a while. These changes have not been welcomed in that it not being the same established gameplay as half the reason, but the gameplay is literally not fun nor is there rhyme or reason in engagement for the other half. That's why people hated Sticker Star and Color Splash. The gameplay was badly designed. It was held back by really small, really mundane features that should have been there. And that's also why people are generally not in favor of Origami King's combat, despite the favorable feedback for this one. The combat is the main issue people are taking note of. The game still pukes thousands to tens of thousands of coins in filling holes, saving toads, hitting blocks, and doing puzzles. Basic exploration, which is more appealing, that coins aren't enough for TOK's battles to be incentivizing in the long run. XP and natural stat progression would benefit that gameplay so much, and yet it's such a tiny detail. If not that, if they truly wanted to ditch the RPG moniker, which I honestly do not buy, there still needs to be some incentive or reward only battles provide that then you give people a reason to go out and do them more often. Not only this, but the combat is already super bare bones and simple as is that it needs a lot more attack variety and enemy variety to continue the engagement. It's not just a lack of XP and or genuine incentive those last two games suffered from. There's little variety in attacks and very little strategy that keeps these battles entertaining for long, and Origami King also suffers from this alongside the incentive for battles not being a genuinely good or proper one. Plus consumable attacks in those two, but Origami King fixes this problem. That and changing the battle system, the core gameplay, super heavenly constantly, is not healthy either. So many franchises succeed and thrive from consistency. That's how people gel with a franchise. That's how that franchise gains momentum, love, and an identity. It needs consistency. There are almost zero franchises out there that benefit from constantly changing their core formula as much as Paper Mario has. The main thing sequels do all the time is they keep whatever formula they established and they add new mechanics or tweak what was there, if not both. There's a reason Super Mario Bros. 2 or Zelda 2 Link's Adventure are considered the black sheep of their franchises, because they changed their styles and gameplay significantly enough to where it turned people off. On the flip side, 2D Mario has gone through standardization since New Super Mario Bros, and despite the criticism that series gets, those games are some of the best-selling Mario games of all time and are met with general praise and love despite that. You know why? It's another 2D Mario game so people are familiar with, and it has the same kind of platforming and gimmicks you'd expect, so most people enjoy them. The 3D Mario games also followed a very standard formula with tweaking and new changes made to it that they're considered some of the best Mario games. Super Mario Sunshine took 64's worlds, made them bigger, introduced Flood upon many other things, but it's still Mario 64's sandbox style. Later, Mario games are significantly linear in structure, but the format and gameplay do make up the same style, appeal, and purpose all the same. Mario Kart, exact same way. Physics change, items and courses change along with characters, and there's usually some big mechanic change or addition like anti-gravity, bikes, or gliding, but it's the same franchise using the same format and style as it was since Super Mario Kart. 
Kirby, Call of Duty, 2D Donkey Kong, both top-down Zelda and 3D Zelda, Fire Emblem, Super Smash Bros., Final Fantasy for a while, Dragon Quest, Crash Bandicoot, any other Mario subseries. Like, people pretend revisiting the OG style would be stale and boring when they've only done it twice in the entire franchise, and when they forget a vast majority of other franchises I mentioned upon others not mentioned, don't change their core styles by a significant degree, and they completely get off pseudo scot free. Most of them add new gameplay mechanics, physics, and tweaks to their styles that avoids them from hitting staleness. Smash with different physics, characters, and modes, Super Mario Odyssey with Cappy, the capture mechanic, etc. It makes no sense to believe Paper Mario would suffer from that when it's not just done relatively little of that style, and when they can still expand and add to that style for several games to come without wearing thin as dozens upon dozens of other franchises do. Them constantly needing to change for the sake of it falls flat when the changes themselves, especially since the beginning, aren't that good and when most people didn't like them. Not every change isn't inherently going to be good. That's why people have different experiences and why that consistency matters. It's also why opinions and criticism exist, why game design is seen in such a critical fashion to some. Change is never inherently going to be good if it's a bad one for genuine and valid reason. Trying to appeal to the casual crowd isn't a problem either. But Paper Mario never struggled with this. The RPG gameplay is complex when you break it down, but it's not hard to understand. It's super simple and easy to follow, and how complex you can make it is how you want, and that's part of the appeal of the gameplay. The art style is a cartoony, pop-up, book-like style that's more kitty and childlike than Mario usually is, and even then, it's freaking Mario. It's never gonna struggle appealing to the casual crowd when it's one of the most casual-friendly games out there, especially when the gameplay is casual-friendly for an RPG. That and the traditional RPG gameplay inherently involves puzzles and strategy right at the start. Puzzle elements are fine, and a greater emphasis on them is completely welcome too, but not when it's at the expense of one of the biggest characteristics of Paper Mario. Most RPGs require you to plan the most efficient strategy for combat and the badges, partners, audience, specials, and XP, on top of all of this being interwoven into the core gameplay style, adds puzzle and strategy elements already. Color Splash tried to replicate XP with the hammer scraps, it's still attempted at capturing an RPG element in a Paper Mario claim to be an action adventure, but the hammer scraps limit the progression the player will make from normal puzzle solving and they don't have any major impact throughout the game. Even then, Sticker Star and Origami King got rid of any incentive for battles outside coins. That and the incentive to fight matters a lot more than most assume. It's why you bother with the gameplay, the ultimately biggest reason a game is made, often why most people bother with them. Battles are a lot more than a simple hurdle and should be treated as such. If you have no reason to engage in them, especially when the game can provide plenty of that same incentive if there debatably is one in a much more entertaining manner, then what's the point? It is more than just an RPG, but it being an RPG was one of the biggest things that made Paper Mario Paper Mario. To pretend and act like it wasn't that big of a strength or vocal point comes off as severely tone deaf and ignorant to what the series was and stood for for the first decade of its life. Also, no longer to create original characters or modify pre-existing characters since Sticker Star. Okay, but why though? He states there are these restrictions apparently without going further into detail and clearing the air. All that's there to go off of is one of Miyamoto's comments, which he seemingly personally clinging to. D Super Mario Odyssey. That game introduces so many new races and characters new to Mario, and people adore 3D Mario for expanding itself like that whenever it does on top of giving Mario literal thousands of modifications for outfits along with Peach and a bit of Bowser. Mario Kart has been adding new skins of characters with metal variants and creating baby versions of them, on top of adding a ton more character variety than Paper Mario does. Mario Kart Tour goes even harder with the reskins on many characters, Mario and Peach especially, not to mention Paul Rosalina, the Donkey Kong characters, Nabbit, Daisy, and many others that Paper Mario could benefit from using. Luigi's Mansion as well reintroduced the portrait ghost in 3 and meeting that fan demand and criticism the series got from Dark Moon. Like, it's great that 3D Mario and Luigi's Mansion are getting this, but why are all the other th Mario subseries having no issue adhering to feedback? Why are all the other Mario games getting what Paper Mario desperately needs, yet Paper Mario is the one with these restrictions? It doesn't make any sense. Mario games have been modifying pre-existing characters all the time, and others have had little to no trouble satisfying those fans and consumers providing that feedback, so it being difficult to satisfy the OG fans comes off as sheepish or again, narrow-minded and ignorant. Not to mention the battles are still turn-based like a traditional RPG. 
like Paper Mario always had, except Super, and there is stat progression in the form of accessories. Whether Tanabe or you like it or not, Paper Mario was and will always be ingrained in that RPG genre, even to smaller degrees. Given that was the original vision of the series, that's the foundation it built itself off and what made it so popular among other factors, and even recent games visibly clearly don't let go of certain RPG aspects of both the genre and classic Paper Mario altogether, no matter how much Tanabe tries to claim they're trying to remove those RPG elements. And lastly, speaking of those RPG elements in story, going back to Super Paper Mario, to claim its story led it away from the Mario universe completely misses the point of what Super was trying to go for. I made this its whole part in why Paper Mario changed. Ryota Kawade emphasized the entire point of Super Paper Mario's story was to bring Mario and his friends into and to introduce new characters from quote unquote a Mario world that's not really a Mario world. The weird alien albeit simple character design, the radically epic story, the bizarre crazy world you go to, Super Paper Mario was trying to capture that alien extremely weird feel. That was both the entire point and entire appeal of that game. Both Kawade and Tanabe co-directed Super, yet Tanabe has the audacity to claim Super's story was what drifted Mario too far away from his universe, when that was the point. I'm sorry, but that comes off as disrespectful to me to both the average Paper Mario fan and Kawade, especially when so many consumers who played the game shared the same vision Ryo to Kawade did. To keep using that Club Nintendo survey as proof people dislike the story as well is ridiculously absent-minded to how many people actually did adore the story and originality of Super Paper Mario and to how vocal that specific outcry is for the general franchise. It literally takes a single, small, cursory glance at the internet. Forums, YouTube videos, reviews on these individual games, videos of these individual games, on any Paper Mario game for the most part, in many different forms, millions expressed that basically everyone loves the story in Super Paper Mario. Basically everyone loves the story in Paper Mario as a whole, tied to the creativity, the RPG gameplay, etc. That's why we keep expressing our concern and are so upset over this. Why we hate they continue to distance themselves from what the majority want, what the series was, and why they keep following flawed ideals that are continuously destructive to the overall brand, are contradicted by vast majority of other franchises and games that are just as, if not more beloved and successful than Paper Mario, and why it's continuously making Paper Mario as unnecessarily divided and split as it is. This is only one interview so far. But I want to touch on Miyamoto here again and go a little more on Tanabe. So throughout this video, I expressed how Tanabe was following Miyamoto's comments and instilling those ideas on his co-workers and the no longer possible to modify Mario characters bit. Which I think is BS, but potentially a half-truth. Tanabe's making it sound like he's being restricted, like it reeks of quote-unquote mandates being created to limit creative freedom, and why he says it's difficult on trying to appeal to that classic crowd. And I've shown how Miyamoto isn't too big on story, but he's not the one making these games. He's barely involved in Paper Mario since Sticker Star. If those restrictions were a thing that mattered heavily to him, again, why is it that Super Mario Odyssey and these other Mario games can get away with it? Some of these being made both in-house at Nintendo and by third-party development studios. Not only this, but Miyamoto recently expressed how he's trying to do basically the opposite. In an interview with Nikkei, Miyamoto largely expresses how he wishes for Mario to be the next Mickey Mouse. The topic of Mario eventually becoming the next Mickey Mouse can be discussed another time, but Miyamoto's creative direction has been changing for a while now. They mentioned how there's a certain consistency Miyamoto tried to maintain, but while giving a sense of familiarity, it was cramping Miyamoto's style. Miyamoto then was inspired to avoid casting Mario too rigidly and to give him more freedom and creativity to explore various scenarios. I quote, I've become more interested in creating greater opportunities for a larger audience to enjoy. And ever since the Switch, we've been seeing this. Once again, Super Mario Odyssey introduces brand new characters and worlds and mechanics. Miyamoto was hardly involved in that game too, and largely let Kenta Motokura and Yoshiaki Koizumi and many other newer, younger developers take the helm. An even bigger example of this, the upcoming Super Mario movie. There was a time Miyamoto was completely against the idea of these games getting a movie especially after that live-action Mario movie from way back when. But recently, Miyamoto gave Nintendo and Illumination the okay to make the movie. The overall quality of the Mario movie is still something we're gonna have to wait for, but Miyamoto has become significantly more open with letting Mario breathe in creativity, identity, and diversity lately. This is why I cannot stress enough why people need to drop this fallacy, why I keep repeating over and over, Paper Mario's direction isn't Miyamoto's fault. 
Miyamoto's hardly been directly involved in both Paper Mario and regular Mario as of late. He gave advice to a different development studio a decade ago that has not remained the same since. Tanabe and the rest of the intelligence systems are the ones enforcing that old advice. And the way Tanabe wards being unable to modify characters, input a bigger story, or revisit the RPG gameplay largely sounds like it's some mandate, it reeks of a mandate being put in place by higher ups. But again, it doesn't sound like Miyamoto would do something like that. There's one post on Resetera that may be worth pondering, but keep in mind it's a forum post. It could very well be false and misleading, misinformation. So let's say for argument's sake, this is conjecture, that this is speculation on someone for the sake of accuracy and factual information. The post comes from Kay Cannon, who states that Aquamarine, a previous insider, provided context for the supposed mandate. Basically, Nintendo has a quality assurance team that makes sure games stay consistent. Around 2009, Miyamoto and others felt contractors like Camelot, Alpha Dream, or in this case Intelligence Systems, were too liberal with their creative decisions on games, specifically interpretations of the Mario IP. So, after the early Wii era, they started watching over everything and establishing standards. It basically sounds like some kind of brand unification, like Disney does with Mickey Mouse. And when you combine this with Tanabe's words on modifying characters and whatnot, this does make a decent stroke of sense. Since the middle of the Wii's lifespan up to the Wii U, you saw many Mario games adopting the same generic style and ideas and limits on creativity, New Super Mario Bros. being the same iterative installment since the DS, Super Mario 3D Land and 3D Worlds being super linear and safe with its world and gameplay style, Super Mario Galaxy 2 dialing back almost entirely on a story and a subplot that the first game had, I specified that in the previous video, Sticker Star and Color Splash doing the same, Mario and Luigi Dream Team reusing various ideas, not going as hard with the originality and gameplay, Paper Jam especially adopting that standardization problem the 2D games suffered, why the last Mario and Luigi games were remakes of the best ones, it could also explain why characters like Toadsworth have been MIA since Mario and Luigi Dream Team, why there's such little differentiation in character design and originality. But again, why does Super Mario Odyssey get so much liberal freedom with its characters, its depictions, and variety? It being made in-house at Nintendo? Okay, then why does Luigi's Mansion 3 have that with its portrait ghost return and its return to a traditional style of exploration? It was developed by Next Level Games, a not first party studio, along with Tanabe as a producer. Why have Donkey Kong, Wario, and such gotten away with these creative liberties? And why were these set on Mario in the first place if they were never a problem to begin with? Again, those Paper Mario games, Mario and Luigi, Super Mario Galaxy, Odyssey, like these games were popularized from those liberal choices. People want that out of those games. Like, this comes across as completely unnecessary and tone deaf once again. That and it definitely doesn't align with Miyamoto's recent comments on the Mario brand. If this is true, then this feels super unnecessary, especially when this was never a problem for Mario at all. But I feel like this entire specific point on Tanabe and mandates is a half-truth scenario. Because the way Tanabe expresses this, how he's involved in Paper Mario games, how the team responds and takes in information and ideas from him going off Risa Tabata's quote, how him and the whole team is restricted apparently, and how he's the one called to a majority of these interviews most of the time, it makes it sound like he has more reign than your average producer. He's brought on by gaming journalists and speaks in ways that make it sound like he's been the director even though he's not. Like, you hear plenty of Tarakudo and now Hiko Aoyama on Sticker Star, but not nearly as much with Color Splash. Little of them there, little of Risa Tabata on Color Splash, some of her Masahiko Nagaya, the director of The Origami King, on The Origami King, but a majority of information on all three, especially the big ones, largely come from and are tied to Tanabe. So this makes me ponder how much reign he has on other projects. I found another interview discussing Tanabe and Retro Studio's involvement in developing past projects, largely discussing Metroid Prime and how Prime 4 was delayed. Nintendo enthusiasts made an article that sums up Tanabe's involvement with Retro, the Metroid Prime series, and what to make of Prime 4's delay, but it brings up an interview conducted by Liam Robertson, both of which will be linked down below among the other sources and interviews, where Retro and Tanabe have creative differences. Tanabe moved over to Retro Studios to help work on Donkey Kong Country Returns, while Team Ninja and Yoshio Sakamoto worked on Metroid Other M. Tanabe left after DKCR and Tropical Freeze, and they didn't leave on the best terms it seems. Liam Robertson spoke with various developers who worked with Tanabe, and described his work ethic as authoritarian, alleged to explode with passion if a developer made a mistake or challenged his own creative decisions. His hands-on style of game development also didn't mesh well with Retro, as the studio felt they deserved to create much more freely and loosely without Nintendo's executives from Japan breathing down their necks. Tanabe seemed to have 
quote unquote upheld the Japanese creative sensibilities of Nintendo at an otherwise western studio. And apparently while Retro butted heads with him during Tropical Freeze, Nintendo removed Tanabe from the development studio shortly after the game was done in favor of someone else. Now Tanabe's back with Retro for Metroid Prime 4, hopefully they sorted some stuff out or will sort it out if they haven't. I do hope Metroid Prime 4 works out and development goes smoothly as I'm curious about Metroid overall. But even when he's producer, he's been enforcing developers to work under specific guidelines and restrictions and his own philosophies no matter who, no matter what company may say. That's why I feel like it's a half-truth with this whole restrictions thing, because some brand unification, some higher up at Nintendo could be all limit Mario to this or that, like that forum post claims, but not only does that go against what at least Miyamoto wants with Mario moving forward, not only do various Mario games as of late have either had little struggle in adhering to outcries or criticism and changes people want, if not outright denying those Japanese creative sensibilities, along with various other Nintendo games, Tanabe has clearly been given more power and more reign over these games in development, at least more into the detriment of Retro and Donkey Kong than people assume. It's looking to be a similar case with Paper Mario, which I've been explaining and pondering how it could be him making more calls and shots than one would believe, despite his producer role. Again, it's not like those ideals behind Paper Mario are relevant. Miyamoto wants Mario to be more creative and less rigid now. There's so far no good reason for these changes and willful dismissions of creative feedback and constructive criticism to take place. We've had Nintendo executives respect Miyamoto and challenge his beliefs numerous times in the past, in and outside Nintendo itself. It's stuff like this that's why I've been keeping an eye on him lately. Once you start to see this relationship between consumers and the studio behind the product slash IP quiver, fans will start digging and looking at what's going on, what's wrong, why aren't these games delivering as past games have in certain ways. Like I've dug a little on Metroid Prime overall, and I'm aware Tanabe produced and had more creative control over Metroid Pinball, Prime Hunters, and Federation Force. Tanabe did co-produce the first Prime game, as well as produce 2 and 3, but Shigeru Miyamoto produced Metroid Prime as well, and him and Retro Studios' collaboration was what molded Metroid Prime into what it was, with Prime 2 and 3 largely credited to Retro Studios afterwards. Despite that, Tanabe's been given larger credit as of late for just taking part in the producer role, and we see with Donkey Kong and Retro, Tanabe hasn't had the most adequate synergy with Retro for that, which makes their involvement in Prime 4 after the Fallout a little scary. Next Level and Retro Studios weren't happy with Federation Forces development either, Next Level had most of the control with Luigi's Mansion 3, and Chibi Robo, a series originally overseen by Miyamoto as senior producer, waned in lackluster sequels, especially in the case of Ziplash which Tanabe also had control over. Despite being a game involving menial labor, Ziplash was an action and platforming spinoff that was panned hard, and while I'm not 100% sure how much Tanabe was involved or how much control he had there, him and Risa Tabata were called upon in interviews again, and there is one where he clarifies how if Ziplash doesn't do well, it could effectively be the last game in the franchise. So that makes me think it's more than normal. Not only is that insanely depressing for Chibi Robo and Chibi Robo fans, on top of rumors of their company going under as well, but this effectively paints a clearer picture whether or not mandates or restrictions are in place by someone else. Ever since Sticker Star, Tanabe does seem to have significant creative control over some of these franchises, particularly with Paper Mario and it's not looking good. I don't know the guy, his character and personality may be different if I did know him, but as a game developer, not only are his ideals are something I disagree with heavily as they're contradictory and don't hold up when you account other Nintendo franchises, it's effectively an agree to disagree, a clash of different visions and opinions at most since I'm one dude on the internet, but I don't want this dude working on Paper Mario. He's effectively doubled down on Miyamoto's comments from Sticker Star which changed. He's claiming about all these restrictions, dismissions, and changes that are necessary when they're both ultimately not and go at odds with what other Mario games have done recently. He's purposefully ignoring and shoving away a majority of criticism and feedback that goes his way, and he's passing most of this and his standards onto his worker peers and juniors. That's not healthy. It's not healthy to limit creative freedom like that among developers. It's super unhealthy and tone deaf to act like that criticism shouldn't be taken and accounted for when developing these games, and they don't even align with the viewpoints and visions his seniors see now. Chibi Robo's likely effectively dead because of this, and Paper Mario continues to suffer and be more divided and controversial over crap like this.
Going back to Paper Mario, it still continues with Tanabe reinforcing those ideals and Sticker Star's vision. There are a couple more Origami King interviews surrounding the game around release, and the frustration and willingness to ignore continues. One interview from Game Informer covers Tanabe on some of Origami King's development and on the battle system in this. He emphasizes how it's easy to carry over pre-existing elements, then building new systems for each installment, which is why he challenges to continuously make something new. Aoyama wanted a system where enemies surround Mario on all sides in Color Splash, so Tanabe expressed how that was the basis for Origami King's combat. How they designed the boss battles, how the worlds are huge and structured in a traditional format, which was one of the few genuinely good choices made for Origami King after Color Splash, and how they quote unquote never considered whether or not we should implement a party based system like other games, focusing on letting characters join Mario along the way for more memorable moments. So every Mario and Luigi is not a new experience. Despite the story, the characters, the combat, the gameplay, same for TTYD from Paper Mario, a majority of 3D Marios, Smash Bros, Zelda, Kirby, Metroid, etc. Despite how many different physics, mechanics, ideas, stories, etc. for these games that I already specified earlier, only because they use the same system as prior games, it isn't a new experience. Okay, apologies for the cynic behavior, but like, this is ridiculous! So many games have done more than adequate jobs in delivering different ideas, different experiences without changing what makes that game work. That's what sequels are supposed to do and what they do all the time. I've said this like twice. Like how come he doesn't get this? Another interview from Games Radar discusses more Origami King with Kensuke Tanabe, Risa Tabata, and Masahiko Nagaya, director of the Origami King. They were pondering what other paper idea would be the main centerpiece and driving force of the game, which eventually led to Origami. Tanabe mentions how they tried to move away from paper themes for the battles, how Aoyama came up with the idea again, as well as the boss fights like in the previous interview, how the 1000 volt arms was constructed, how they incorporated collectibles and toad hunting to give these huge worlds a benefit for exploring, the prospect of turning characters into Origami, and once again, reiterating how, quote unquote, from the production of Paper Mario's Sticker Star onwards, we were no longer able to graphically represent individual characteristics, such as age, gender, etc. in the Toad NPCs, non-playable characters, and so it has become that much more important to convey their personalities simply through text. Again, they're not saying who or why specifically these limitations were set. They're not clearing the air if there genuinely is something they're not telling us, or can't tell us. That Miyamoto quote is literally the only thing to go off of, which changed. Again, dated advice that changed over time and is still contradicted by other games. There's an interview on a Spanish website, Van Gamers, translated by Google, so apologies if there's any butchered translation or if stuff gets lost. The same three people were interviewed, and it starts with how Paper Mario started, and Risa Tabata discusses the paper idea. She was questioned if they were afraid of running out of ideas relating to paper, though she emphasized how they came up with origami and confetti, and how quote unquote, it is not easy to come up with new ideas related to paper that can be used as a basis for a game system, and we constantly have to face this challenge. However, I believe that as long as paper continues to exist in this world, there will always be new ideas related to paper that will inspire us. They also discussed general development, mappings, level design, the combat again, translating the writing and comedy to English via the Nintendo of America localization team, the same character diversity limit reiterated in other interviews, but there's also a bit where the prospect of Paper Mario as an RPG, considering they've had two Mario RPG series, is decided among the development team itself, which led to Paper Mario being more action-adventure focused. Something seemingly the whole team settled on, or at least Tanabe even agrees with, which, god damn it, why do we keep circling back to this specific debate? Mario and Luigi are not the same RPGs as classic Paper Mario. The storytelling and narrative is not the same at all, the gameplay and combat is radically different between the two, the charm and focus on comedy isn't the same nor balanced, like holy crap bro, Paper Mario is a lot slow and more strategy focused than Mario and Luigi is, which is much faster, more reaction based, and focuses more on strengthening these Mario characters we've known and loved, while Paper Mario introduces new worlds and characters for Mario to interact with. The only similarities they share are that they are RPGs, they share that genre, and they take place in Mario's world involving Mario's characters. Unfortunately, big shocker, they deliver completely different experiences with completely different stories, different characters, and completely different gameplay that this comparison since Color Splash is not an apt or valid one to strip Paper Mario's identity. Like, so many people, not just me, specified this exact key difference in Mario and Luigi to Paper Mario and why there shouldn't be a comparison between the two, especially when they never clashed against each other with their first three installments. And even then, the prospect of having two Mario RPGs isn't even true anymore. 
Forget Paper Mario being more action adventure orientated, Mario and Luigi and the entire Mario RPG genre is effectively dead at the moment. Alpha Dream, the studio that makes Mario and Luigi, filed for bankruptcy almost a year ago. Nintendo now has full rights over Mario and Luigi, but we have zero idea if they're gonna do anything with it, or when we'd hear anything from them. For all we know, Mario and Luigi could effectively be in limbo. Mario plus Rabbids was a one-time thing largely handled by a third party, which is a completely different kind of RPG more than those two Mario RPGs are to each other, and Paper Mario, even with its roots and elements still in recent games, just not fleshed out and missing others, is focusing more on an entirely different genre while gutting its core. Mario RPGs at this moment in time are super dead right now, so if anything, this makes this comparison between the two even more unfair and ridiculous, because now Paper Mario has nothing to compare as far as Mario RPGs go. The last Origami King interview is from a German website, PC Games, interviewing the same three people, Tabata, Tanabe, and Nagaya, and for this one, we're gonna go paragraph by paragraph, or topic by topic. Like the Game Informer interview, Tanabe mentions how they don't consider implementing a partner system like past games and how they focus on the moments Origami King has with Olivia, Bobby, and the others. So he kept reiterating this, and while this likely was altered mid-development going off his words, they went through the effort of making partners a thing in combat anyway despite claiming that and how hard it is to please the OG crowd, even if it is half-assed. The partners in Origami King serve a narrative purpose that works, that's a different debate. But they have a random chance of landing an attack, they're not a part of the core battle system at all, they attack after you, you have zero control over them in and outside battles, and they don't last for very long either since they're temporary. He claims they can't revisit any of those ideas the OG games had, or any RPG mechanics, yet they bother to implement the partners in Origami King despite his comments, the hammer scraps and color splash, and they're added in a way that does not affect the gameplay almost at all, so it's like they might as well not have bothered anyway since they ultimately don't matter outside the story and narrative beats. Upon being asked about normal object bosses, Tanabe settled on the office supply bosses given how they fit the paper theme, and he states how Paper Mario is all about the paper, which, god damn it, again, no, no it's not, how many times do we have to go through this, oh my god, Paper Mario was about the story, it was about the RPG gameplay, it was about the unique and original characters, holy hell, why must I and many others have to act like a broken record, people didn't like Paper Mario because it was paper. The paper aesthetic was one of the last things. It was one of the last things people praise and acknowledge when they talk about how good either 64, T2ID, or Super Paper Mario are. Centralizing on the paper part completely misses the appeal. We liked Paper Mario because it was Mario's story. This also ties to another problem some have with the modern games. This intense focus and over-centralization on the paper. The paper jokes in the last three games, effectively amounting to the same exact punchline dozens upon dozens of times. The story and plots needing to revolve around a paper gimmick, the gameplay largely focusing on a paper theme, stickers, paint, and confetti, the white outlines, the super intense paper mache look, the office supply bosses, the origami folded characters. There are people out there that do not like this in any of the three modern games. Some do like this, plenty may not care or mind at all, and that's fine. But you have to understand, there are people out there that do not like this for good reason, and as great as the presentation is for Origami King, I do honestly agree. It sucks the immersion out of the experience, the fact the bosses are office supplies, and Ollie's motivation for a villain is tied to a theme related to paper, forget it being a bad one in its own way, it stops making situations and big, heartfelt moments in these games feel serious, important, and meaningful, and it trivializes them to where it makes itself out like a joke, intentionally or not. Even when it is intentional, it isn't clever when it's done to death hundreds of times individually each game, and I just don't care about what's going on as much as I should when they do this a lot. Like, once you find out why Ollie does what he does, and why the Origami King even happens, and then you consider how sympathetic and sad Olivia is throughout the game, what Bobby does especially, and it just makes everything feel so disappointingly nonchalant and not as important as the game continuously makes itself out to be, which is honestly bad writing to me. That's primarily why I hate Ollie as a villain, and why I'm not a fan of this paper-themed focus. Yeah, yeah, it's a Mario game, but most of them take themselves seriously and try to engage the player in narrative ways more often than you think, especially when there's some plot involved, which is why the OGs are beloved as well. When the modern games try to do both, yet it doesn't even know how to balance between the two and emphasize more how much of a paper world it is, it fails to immerse you within itself, on top of the papier-mâché look and the white outlines, making these characters and worlds feel artificial and fake 
and not lived in or real, so you're engaged and invested significantly less as a result. Origami King does dial back on this a notch, and it does other things to make these worlds and characters feel real, genuine, natural, alive, and fantastic, but the point still stands. This intense focus is something that goes at odds with the series' original vision, and there are plenty of people who genuinely do not like this specific focus. You're welcome to disagree with all this you're, if you're fine with the paper focus, the heavy paper theme and writing, but I personally feel it shouldn't be a part of Paper Mario. Whenever classic Paper Mario made some paper themed visual or joke, it was always visual and as a side element involving platforming and exploration without it being in your face. It was subtle, it was an aesthetic, and it never overstepped its boundaries. Since Sticker Star, writing and jokes are constantly at the forefront in the game's humor and dialogue and it wears off when you notice it's all the same joke. The punchline is the same over and over. It's not funny, it's not creative, it gets stale super quickly. The bosses being art supplies, attacks before being objects, and art supplies, characters constantly pointing out how they're folded, creased, flat, etc. This intense self-awareness of the style hampers any immersion the player has, at least for me, with investing in either characters or moments. They come off as artificial and distracting, and it can lose player investment with writing or narration. It doesn't feel real, which is what the first three Paper Marios felt. Origami King dials back on this and succeeds in other areas with this again, but it's still present throughout and the point still stands. Once again, we didn't like Paper Mario because it was paper. We loved Paper Mario because it was Mario's story. Back to the interview, Tanabe expresses how they're limited once again, how they try to give Toad small outfits pertaining to an occupation they have, and that's it. How they can't have gender varied or age varied Toads and such, the humor. Risa Tabata expresses how again they thought of origami along with believing how paper should always play a central role as a motif in Paper Mario. How they assemble origami, how they make the minigames, the risks of the battle system, etc. That's the gist of the last interview. So Tanabe and the others continue to enforce change just for the sake of it, regardless of what kind of feedback they receive. They're apparently restricted in going further, despite information claims in recent games contradict said limitations. There's an even larger disconnect between the intelligence system's developers and the fans, an insane misunderstanding and fabrication of what Paper Mario used to be, and this has been an ever-growing debacle since Sticker Star. The standardization critiques still plague all three games, they all still focus intensely on the paper aspect, they all share a good chunk of the same problems and drawbacks, and the series now continues to follow the same philosophies and ideals as the developers have now, from Color Splash since Sticker Star. There's another problem most of this created involving Paper Mario fans that Color Splash and Sticker Star also enforced. Fans on social media, Reddit, YouTube, Twitter, etc. I've had personal experiences largely from Twitter, which follow me on Twitter if you want and or if you like my YouTube content. Paper Mario, specifically the fans of the series, new and old, have been stuck in this needless civil war of sorts. The constant need to change things up for the sake of it, this willingness to follow that one Miyamoto comment, this idea that it's good and healthy for them to keep doing this, that it's fine to ignore the criticism and feedback, it's good to not return to the original style as it would get stale, the series not being an RPG, or it being an RPG not being one of the main focuses or appeals, the false notion of Paper Mario being just about the paper, and this constant need to overemphasize that and make it a core influence on everything surrounding the series now. All of this, and then some, has created another issue in that people have been using this as fuel against the backlash, against the criticism, defending the change the series undergone. There's nothing wrong if you like these games for any of these reasons or reasons I never mentioned. If you wanted to try them prior, almost any opposition against this direction isn't made at attacks against fans of the newer games. There's a small minority of OG fans that do attack those people and don't represent the general overall community, that's literally how every fandom goes, but it's still super disingenuous and narrow-minded to assume it's as toxic and simple when people like myself and many others express over and over why it's recommended to revisit the original style. This has been a thing since Sticker Star, despite the majority is in favor of the OG style, but it's escalated with each new game following its vision. Now, more than ever, and I'm largely speaking from personal experience, you're met with plenty of people defending these choices, these design philosophies, these genuine flaws in these games, and so many people chalk these up as TTYD elitists choosing to not let go of their game they're super nostalgic over. But that's so infuriatingly disingenuous and ignorant again. Chugga Conroy. Big and awesome YouTuber, one of the nicest guys out there, chose not to double down on Origami King. He hates Sticker Star and was burnt out on it and Color Splash. He disagrees with the direction and he chose not to get Origami King, but he got flack for that choice. 
despite he has every right to make that call if he so chooses. Any YouTuber or anyone at all expressing various thoughts on old or modern Paper Mario, or even just how good any OG game is, or point out any flaw of the recent games, then it's a quick label of being a nostalgic elitist who can't handle change or something to that effect. Which is again ignorant and disingenuous, especially when I and most people don't even hate Origami King as a game. As a game again, I think it's decent, and I have zero qualms with admitting its strong suits. But it's not a simple, not TTYD, bad vilification. The annoying thing is, a trailer's purpose is to judge the game based on what's shown, good or bad, that started since the first trailer. People have had suspicions of TOK since, like me, but even being cautiously optimistic can get you lynched when shutting that negative judgement down completely ruins the purpose of a trailer, especially when in favor of positive judgments because that's playing the hypocrite. I had to play the game, review, see it for myself and all that stuff for most people to be fine with most of what I say and feel, but it's ridiculous for me to even go through with that when most of my feelings and thoughts on this game and franchise are largely the same since the first trailer, since Color Splash. It was an improvement from Color Splash, which I expected, writing and character delivered more than I hoped, which I expected, but the gameplay and overall narrative and theming still left me disappointed, which I expected. People need to stop antagonizing criticism over a trailer when that's not only the point, but those judgments can often easily meet reality based on that and it creates this unnecessary false mindset and needless drama, especially when Color Splash and Origami King met expectations I had largely. I and others should not have to cater to people who say otherwise if our suspicions and thoughts are going to be verified. That shouldn't be how gaming discourse over a trailer works. Color Splash was expected to be Sticker Star 2, and it definitely was. I had that mindset with Sonic Forces, and it became one of the biggest disappointing Sonic games ever. It's completely fair for people to judge based off a trailer. It's hypocritical when people favor the positive over the negative, when it's a judgement all the same. That change was evident since the start, and people need to understand this. With the massive outcry against modern Paper Mario since Sticker Star, the need to change has been misplaced. Miyamoto's advice from Sticker Star not only changed, but when dozens of other franchises and hundreds of other games have benefited from not changing the core style, like Paper Mario enthusiasts want, upon other debates that spring up. And, and I know there's this bias with me favoring the original style and all that, I get it, so there's a skew, I apologize, but outside the fans that'll gatekeep or shame people for liking anything about the new games, or not minding them, it makes me think a lot of distrust among the community, the animosity and hate towards anyone who likes and or prefers the OG style, is super misplaced. Again, Origami King has good writing and character in my opinion, there are good things about the game, but that and anything critical I have to say about it and other Paper Mario's doesn't or at least shouldn't affect your overall enjoyment and experience of the game. It's a single man's opinion, same for other fans and any gamer out there, but it's not fair to dismiss the criticism and genuine faults and issues people have with this and others. Them needing to change for the sake of it's misplaced when people have expressed hundreds of times why those changes aren't welcome. Change never inherently makes anything good. Bad changes exist, people are affected by those changes and explain how and why they are bad or good. Some people need to get this, again, Mario 2 and Zelda 2, Black Sheep because of that change, because it wasn't good for one reason or another. Wanting that return to form isn't an instant nostalgia blinded assessment, when the original style has many great aspects and good design, between the characters and the gameplay, backing it up. It's why people hate the modern game's battle systems. It's one of the few consistent changes to Paper Mario, but battling across all three largely lack incentive, engagement, and reason to battle. The original style had incentive and reason to fight, and the gameplay is both really fun and heavily replayable because of its design. To many, what Sticker Star did was a bad change that's continued to remain. Bad changes exist. Everything in this world, change or not, isn't instinctively good just because and vice versa. It's not even because it's different in most cases with Paper Mario. There's a ton of 64 and Thousand Year Door fans who adore Super Paper Mario, despite how radically different it was in story, but especially gameplay. People appreciate some of Origami King's elements that are different as well, and there are plenty of other franchises that do different stuff that people like. It being different or a change isn't the problem. It's that the change itself can hold the possibility of being a bad one for a multitude of reasons. Franchises also benefit from being consistent to a formula, what people want Paper Mario to do. Pokemon was one of the biggest controversies in gaming with Sword and Shield last year, not having all the Pokemon, the paid DLC, among other details. Yet it's become the best selling Pokemon games behind the first two generations. Despite all that backlash, and while Pokemon has problems of its own to sort out, it's another Pokemon game people enjoy and are familiar with. New Pokemon, Gigantamax, and other new details and mechanics are added on top while pertaining to the series' overall identity and appeal. 
Mario Kart does this, Kirby does this, Pikmin, Zelda, other Mario franchises, again, that consistency and identity matters. The change and innovation to a series comes with what they can do to tweak, change, remove, and or add to what was done and or what popularized that series or game. That's what sequels do on the regular. That's what Thousand Your Door was to 64. It took 64's art style, characters, writing, story, gameplay, badges, etc. and increased all of it in numbers, variety, and overall quality. It was an evolution of what the series was at that point. That's all people want when they express a return to form. Not just the carbon copy T2ID2, but an evolution of that style. It's unfair to claim it gets stale too, when not only do sequels manage and succeed what I described 25 seconds ago, but that style has only been done twice in the entire series, and it's been 16 years since. With how many Mario characters that have been introduced since the GameCube, the various story scenarios and possibilities they can make, if they didn't limit themselves on that or the paper themes, they could still do a ton as far as story and even gameplay go. Bug Fables literally takes OG Paper Mario's gameplay and format and does new ideas and mechanics Paper Mario has never done before. You control three characters at once, so two partners, but each one can dish out certain damage depending on the positional order, and you can trade characters their turn to deal certain attacks, but at less damage, like the core battle system of Bug Fables is arguably the most strategic than Paper Mario's core system has ever seen. There are still ways to expand and evolve T2ID, and it's not the only indie game to replicate that original Paper Mario magic. Three different indies are in development, Born of Bread, Scrap Story, Seahorse Saga, like there's several indies that are trying to make the kind of Paper Mario fans have been begging for and are doing new stuff to it to make them stand out and improve the style. If these indies existing don't prove how much and how many people crave the OG style of Paper Mario, I don't know what will. Bug Fables is the only one out now, and I can't stress how much Paper Mario enthusiasts should try it. It is genuinely fun and cute. And for my subscribers, I'll continue my Bug Fables Let's Play after this video. Before as great as these games are and can be, and while not a fault of the games themselves, it's not the same Mario characters or the same Mario world or story. So that want, that desire, is always going to be there. Even outside the additions the gameplay can bring, it could still evolve T2ID from the faults it has. The backtracking and pacing in T2ID can slog super hard for no good reasons at all. They could make a future T2ID-esque Paper Mario not have that much backtracking if at all, make the world bigger and more expansive like Origami King rather than being linear like in T2ID, etc. And another annoying thing is pointing out these games as faults despite pointing out their strengths somehow makes people believe it warrants pointing out the flaws of the game they're using as an example, yet TTYD's backtracking or Super's level design never took away from Sticker Star's battle system or Color Splash's lack of tension or urgency, or Origami King with Bobby's specific action not making sense when compared to past bob Oms of Paper Mario or Ollie's entire motivation and influence. It makes little sense bringing up this kind of relevant information to the topic at hand, and people also try to circumvent what people want out of Paper Mario by acting like before the game came out, there's no grinding with it having no XP, yet star points were designed to be anti-grindy, Paper Mario never suffered from grinding unless you did the pit, which even then wasn't required or necessary, and rubbing in how well Origami King is selling, despite not only was that predictable from the get-go, given how lucrative the Switch and its games are, Super and Sticker Star outsold T2ID as well, which never undermined the point people make when talking about Paper Mario, but people will act toxic in emphasizing this upon other reasons I've mentioned in the book. Like, people try to circumvent a lot of criticism by making up bullock reasons that were non-existent or completely miss the point some try to make, pretending it's good or healthy for Nintendo or intelligence system to essentially disregard the criticism and feedback, when that's one of the most basic relationships a company establishes with a consumer to get a product to sell and succeed, it's both unhealthy and contradictory, damaging to the overall brand and image of the developers, and there's this unnecessary, obnoxious animosity and vilification among Paper Mario fans on both sides. Again. There are bad OG stands who do put the newer fans down for dumb reasons, I'm not excusing those people either, but I hope people who got this far or who saw other videos understand it's not as blanket as people who distrust us claim it to be. Between there were plenty of these people during Color Splash, and especially now that Origami King's reaching an even wider audience, I feel there's even more people who just choose not to even fractionally understand where Paper Mario fans are coming from with all this and they'd rather paint them in a disingenuous light to make their stance superior. And it's both obnoxious and frustrating, especially with these interviews. You can't express a stance without a decent chunk of any side getting on your case. 
and it's ultimately made Paper Mario discourse and being a fan these days, especially with these insider interviews of the recent games, shockingly exhausting. I feel like I'm getting deja vu to Sonic and his entire brand, because believe it or not, between recent games, developer input, and fan split, Sonic can be easily compared to Paper Mario now. I've made the comparison before, both franchises have a severe disconnect between the fans and developers, there's no identity, no real vision or roadmap for what the series should do or be, the gameplay and story is inconsistent, there's a split among fans themselves, based on these different kinds of games, Paper Mario fans don't have it all that different from Sonic fans. The only big difference is every single style Sonic has done, 2D, adventure style, boost, etc, has seen at least one instance of complete success critically, financially, design-wise, etc. With Paper Mario, regardless of how well Sticker Star sold, it's still met with near-universal distaste and color splashes almost the same way. Even with Origami King's generally acceptable ratings, it's still met with problems and grievances largely around the gameplay that the last two games suffered from. Paper Mario hasn't had a successful style since the first three. Ultimately, to sort of wrap a bow on most of this entire discussion, the franchise has seen changes in gameplay since Color Splash, but ever since Sticker Star. Paper Mario refuses to change, or at least change for the better. Because those philosophies continue to shackle the creative freedom people want out of the series, the philosophies themselves are incredibly contradictory and ignorant to how many other Nintendo games, sequels, and designers operate and succeed. Those flawed ideals have been passed on the newer developers by Tanabe, as he seemingly had plenty of control over the development process than a producer may seem. The consumers and fans of Paper Mario continue to get shafted in favor of those flawed ideals, and Paper Mario fans continue to be either vilified by other fans and outside gamers for just wanting a simple return, and because the series chooses to ditch a consistent identity for the sake of unhealthy changes and Paper Mario not having a consistent nor successful style, since either T2ID or Super adds to the frustration of this entire mess. Paper Mario undergoing all these changes in styles and disconnects, it was never necessary. It's only gone and made fans butt heads with the series, the developers, and each other far more than it ever has. It never needed to be standardized like NSMB, it never needed to stray from it being an RPG, nor from a story, it never needed mandates or restrictions of that nature, like a lot of discourse and the changes themselves feel so unnecessary and so much of what makes being a Paper Mario advocate of some kind feel embarrassing or stressful is ridiculously depressing. It's not even like we have a Mario RPG to satiate that specific genre either. Nintendo's just sitting on Mario & Luigi after Alpha Dream went kaput. It's not even like people make that comparison anymore, when they delivered completely different experiences with different visions and already never clashed with each other. Why should Mario RPGs die over a conflict that was never an issue or question, a comparison that never existed up until the developers brought them up in an unfair manner? Why must Tanabe and the developers continuously shaft consumers at the expense of a consistent brand and fun franchise? Why can Super Mario Odyssey and Luigi's Mansion 3 do everything people want intelligent systems to do with Paper Mario, but it's suddenly wrong to even consider asking for Paper Mario to do remotely the same thing? Why does Paper Mario specifically have to suffer at these restrictions literally no one asked for? Why is it bad for anyone to dislike them doubling down on ideals and philosophies that are stale and irredeemable alongside a system that's been continuously criticized and harboring the same exact problems even in newer iterations since the same game literally 95% of people consistently vilify whenever a new Paper Mario is announced? You never see other Mario sub-fandoms or other sub-series or Kirby fans nip at each other's necks because of how consistent they are with their games, how sound their philosophies usually are, and how well designed most of those games are. Paper Mario used to be like that even during Super, but now we have to bear with this direction that people genuinely dislike for a multitude of reasons, all because the developers don't see eye to eye with common game development philosophy nor their core consumer base. And we can hardly do anything about it, because unlike most developers, despite they claim they can't because of reasons that don't add up, they want to follow some outdated advice rather than reflect on why Paper Mario has an appeal, what the series used to stand for, and why their logic and reasoning in dismissing fan demand and genuine criticism is super unfair. It can't be stressed enough how annoyingly, ridiculously, unfairly, astronomically frustrating it is being a Paper Mario fan, having to hear, ponder, go through, and suffer all of this bull. Even with baby steps, it's wrong for me or others to express any of what I've just said in many people's eyes for many unfair reasons. And then there's that, baby steps. Ever since the first Origami King trailer, I've reiterated baby steps. 
I have an issue with this mentality that baby steps to a better game should be the standard. It's at least implying that should be the standard. People kept saying Color Splash was a baby step in the right direction. It was funnier, had memorable dialogue, had more semi-interesting locations, despite its core problems and various flaws between the overemphasis on paper, on originality, bad battle system, etc. People be like baby steps. And now again, the game plays kind of back to how it was despite it's still different and has almost the same exact flaws as Color Splash, the story's ever so slightly better baby steps, guys. Let me stress one more time, Origami King, decent game. Genuine highlights, a part of me gets the satisfaction of it being another baby step. I get it. But how many times are they and y'all gonna keep doing this baby steps BS when we keep asking them to make that leap we've all been clamoring for for years, especially when they have the power? I don't think it's worth defending these baby steps if they're not only capable of doing so much more, especially when they did debatably three times, but the problems that stem from it still don't put nearly close enough to that standard that me or others will be comfortable with. People don't stick around when the product's gradually inching to that form they want. People want the form through and through. I'm not going to be excited for a third double Whopper when the first time only gave me a basic cheeseburger and the second time gave me a regular Whopper. Like, I'm going to want that double Whopper. There are so many times you can just sit there, hope and pray, they listen and take your feedback and give you the order they want when they keep missing ingredients. And when Paper Mario keeps missing those ingredients three times in a row after the ridiculous amount of backlash Color Splash got and they're doing the same experimental BS people said they didn't want on top of playing cat and mouse with these limitations, this kind of info that Paper Mario fans keep asking for that make or break this game to some, let alone the structure or mechanics they keep asking for, I don't know if I want to keep playing that game. I don't mean to sound whiny or incessant, but that is ridiculously mentally exhausting. On top of all the other ridiculous philosophical collisions people have with both developers themselves and the nature of discourse among fans. It's been going on for almost a decade and it's not going to stop. If Origami King is anything to judge for the future of this franchise, despite 3D Mario, Mario Party kind of, and Luigi's Mansion refulfilling those wishes and hopes, I think I'm giving up on the dream for Paper Mario. If it wasn't clear earlier, if I wasn't 100% certain about that the first trailer, then now it is visibly, painfully clear they do not care for the original format. They do not care how many people want that return to form. They do not care how great Paper Mario or Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door was, no matter how true. They do not care how people do not want Paper Mario to be this experimental take on the paper gimmick with the bare bone qualities achieved. They're dead set on experimenting with Paper Mario the whole way through. They keep implementing these little half steps with the partners, the different closer compared RPG battle system to get most fans on board, but they'd rather be tone deaf and play hot potato and darts as opposed to listening to the literal general consumers of this franchise, the majority of actual fans of the series and just go gung ho with whatever they think of. And you know, you know damn well Intelligent Systems is completely capable of delivering that entire experience fans want. They have the games. They can legit copy Pasta T2ID's gameplay and build off of it from there. It's not that hard. The thousands of reviews and feedback on the last two games as well as the first two. They don't have to keep doing these baby steps. They have the power to run goddamn 80 yards and take that leap of faith. But they literally do not want to. So what's the point if they're not going to listen nor do they want to do that, you know? Like, I'm sick of repeating myself. I'm sick of playing the song and dance if they and Paper Mario want to follow an ignorant blind path that's only going to serve to Dieter, this IP, and fans far more in the future. It's enforcing the direction for a franchise I love that I do not fully support. I'm not saying Paper Mario's dead or it has no chance of true, complete revival or whatever, the old preachy, bring back my franchise speech. But Paper Mario is going in an almost completely different direction that's heavily built off the last two games, and that's still not a direction I want out of the series, and it's a shame it's so adamant on, at best, hardly trying to adhere to that outcry most fans do genuinely want. I'm just mentally done investing in this franchise until something like that dream, the actual legitimate full return to form comes to pass. I'll still look into Paper Mario, I still love the series, at least the first three games. I don't think it's worth trying to hope pray and explain why Paper Mario was good, why it had a formula it should stick to, why the new game's issues stick out because of X, Y, and Z, if it just keeps falling on deaf ears every damn time. Like I appreciate you guys for listening and if anything, it's more me venting and putting my thoughts and feelings out, but I'm emotionally dumb bro, I'm good. I might invest again when they genuinely attempt to try at capturing the first two games again, like what literally everyone's been wanting out of this franchise, but they just don't want to listen to that. Will I stop talking Paper Mario? Probably not. I have a series in mind for Paper Mario, and content will still be a thing for Paper Mario here, but for the future, at least for now, 
Unless they like completely circumvent my thoughts for like the next game or whatever. If, if we're lucky. I'm done with this current Paper Mario. I rarely do this. I did this earlier in the video, but I have a Twitter. Would appreciate follows on there if you'd like. I post memes and a bunch of weird stuff on there. I also have a Discord server if you want to join as well. Many of us talk Mario and Smash and whatnot. And there's a lot of good people in there. And with that really, really long video done, I'm done here. Thank you for watching and you're welcome to stick around for more Paper Mario, regular Mario, and other Nintendo videos between discussions, streams, gameplays, and such. Stay super. Bye.